So this play is based on a story written by Srila Govinda Maharaj in 1955 in Bengal. And uh, what it is, uh, it was a Saturday afternoon, and I was coming home from work about 5 o'clock, and uh, it was after a hard day's work, I was very tired, and all my fellow passengers were as tired as I was. And uh, we were all getting on board the train to Katwa, which is uh, the city where uh, Mahaprabhu took sannyas. You, you know this story. And um, <laughs> it, was, it was terribly crowded. Katwa's at least an hour and a half from Calcutta and about halfway to Navadweep. Uh, my friend and I grabbed a seat next to each other and sighed with relief at being one of the lucky ones to have a seat. It was a moment of respite from the long day and uh, the heavy heat of the Calcutta air, and I sat back and relaxed. In a moment, a group of gentlemen, all about the same age, pushed their way into our compartment and settled themselves noisily into their seats. One of them was in his 50s, although he couldn't be considered an old man, but uh, judging by his speech, it was evident that he no longer had the quickness of a young mind. <coughs> Across from us were two young uh, men chanting softly on their japa beads. They were dressed in that saffron-colored rose of Vaishnav monks, and their faces were shining and smiling. Compared to us, they appeared younger than their 20 or so years, and we appeared older than we were. We were at that moment of the day where we were no longer fresh and clean, and that 90 minute train ride was the quiet space in our day between our working lives and our family lives. Looking at the monks' faces, we could see their happiness glowing from within them, and it startled us. This is the story of that late afternoon train ride where we men snug in our roles of businessmen and honorable husbands and dutiful sons saw a glimpse of a world far beyond that train compartment, and indeed, beyond the whole of our lives. sure you get home. Back to God. Back to home. Well, my son, I can't be like you. I have my duty, my dharma, wife and children. I can't be Garunga like you, wandering the earth, chanting the names of God and just begging the world to renounce their lives. Why, if we all became Garungas, then your God's creation would surely come to a halt. Is this not true? <laughs> well, well, yes. In a way, very good. Uh, due to your sense of duty, I can see that you are maintaining this creation. Who else but people like yourself would be so active in doing such a thing? But if you don't mind, can I ask you, where is the proof that you're preserving the creation up to this point in time? Um, well, I, well, huh. uh, This is just wasting our time. Why don't you ask the problem to be fucking serious? Uh, I think he's capable of giving proper answers. <laughs> Yes, yes, 
to ask him a question. I will. So, is there no happiness, you say, in family life? Sir, how can I say either way? I'm a lifelong celibate. So I'm not qualified to speak about the ways of family life. You are better situated than I am to answer this question. Is there happiness or not? I can only guess from looking at all of you. Perhaps you have just come from the office, for instance. There you have to deal all day with your boss's high-handed attitude. I'm sure you can all relate to that. Every evening you board this crowded, dusty train. Get pushed and shoved about. And then you arrive at home, and what will you, what will you find there? Your irate wife's complaints that you're out of rice and dal, that there is no oil or salt, that the children need new clothes, and ah, the list goes on. So it seems like somebody wants something from each of you. Hmm? I think it would not be improper for me to guess the extent of your happiness. Yet, at the same time, I wonder if you really want to hear the clue to real happiness. So, why ask me at all? Tell us, please, what is it, that clue? Tell us about the real thing. Well, in ancient times, the Aryarishis explained this all for our benefit. I'm not giving my opinion. By delving deep into our consciousness, they knew our innermost aspirations and gave expression to that with their sacred pen. Let me give you a sample. Old age has crept up on me, and happiness has vanished. Illness has made me full of sorrow. My senses are weak, and my body has become emaciated. How my heart grieves for the want of life's pleasures. I am devoid of even a drop of real knowledge, and bereft of any sentiments of devotion. Brahmachari Ji, I'm really happy to meet you on this train this evening. Please, don't conserve yourselves with this gentleman. He was having a bit of fun, but today he really made a wrong choice to speak to you in that way. Please, don't mind him. I think I speak for us all when I say we know there is something more than our small lives, yet it's something we can't really see by ourselves. Kindly, give us some simple instructions that we can all follow. In a train compartment like this with so many different types of people, it's hard for an insignificant person like me to give any advice what to speak of trying to help you all. Oh yes, please do, go on, please give us some advice, please do. Oh. <laughs> you, see, oh. you see, even if we say something, will you be able to hear it? And even if you hear it, will you be able to follow? And even if you do understand, Will you make it part of your lives? Anyways, your enthusiasm seems genuine, and so I'm encouraged. I feel, yes, you must try to speak something. Ask us your question, and we will reply as best we can. No questions? <laughs> then first, if you'll forgive my audacity, can you say why you have left? home and family? Oh, no. Your question is very concise and wholly appropriate. However, the answer will take some time, as it involves several other questions first. So you'll have to listen patiently. Can you do that? <laughs> Please do. Go on. <laughs> you see, the first question for everyone, what we must know is, who am I? After ascertaining this, then we can tackle the questions of mind, home, renunciation, why, etc. Who am I? Ke ami. The very question immediately reminds us of Srila Sanatana Goswami. I'm sure more or less all of you have heard his name. Hmm? Yes, I remember reading a poem about him. There was a very beautiful description of how Sanatana Goswami, having found a mystical touchstone that turned everything to gold, had simply cast it under a tree, like any other worthless piece of rock. Later, a Brahmin was desirous of wealth, approached him for the touchstone, and being commanded by Lord Shiva, Sanatana Goswami told him to take the touchstone from under the tree. Soon after taking the precious stone, the man began to realize his foolishness, and returning, he fell at the Goswami's feet, and beseeched him, saying, the treasure that has made you so rich that you do not consider a touchstone worthy, I humbly bow down and beg you, 
please give me just a drop of that which is more precious than a touchstone. In saying so, the Brahmin threw the touchstone into the river. I found it a really charming story. The character of great saints is very <coughs> incomprehensible. Although they themselves are great liberated souls, they show various ways for the welfare of the fallen. Srila Sanatana Goswami was Sriman Mahaprabhu's very close intimate associate. He gave up his prestigious position under the minister, sorry, as minister under the king of Bengal, Hassan uh, Shah. He gave up a life of opulence, all his riches and possessions, and offered himself at the lotus feet of Mahaprabhu at Kashi. That same Sanatana Goswami asked Mahaprabhu on our behalf, who am I? And why do I suffer from the threefold miseries of life? Now Mahaprabhu knew the heart of Sanatana Goswami and said to him, you know the truth of divinity, and therefore you do not suffer from the threefold miseries of life. So I can understand you are asking this question for the benefit of all mankind. Please listen to my answer. Jivena Salupahoy Krishnara Nitidas. By constitution, you are a pure spirit soul. The material body is not your real self. Neither is your mind, your intelligence, or false ego. Your real identity is the eternal servant of the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna. Your natural position is transcendental. The superior energy of the Lord is completely spiritual, and the external material energy is his inferior energy. We are all situated between the spiritual sky and the material world, and therefore our position is marginal. Belonging to this marginal potency of the Lord, we are simultaneously one and different from Krishna. One with him because you are also spiritual by nature, but different because you are only a minute, infinitesimal part of him, the absolute infinity. Whatever you say, whether based on reason or the Shastra, as long as there is a subject, there will be some doubts. Then there must be more questions. So is there any point in hearing what Rama or Shyama or anyone has to say? <laughs> Certainly not. Certainly not. From what you say, I gather you are very fond of logic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. However, no reason or arguments can ascertain the truth of oneself or the nature of God. Can we find examples of this anywhere? Mm -hmm. The object of this world may be governed by theories or arguments, but surely you have heard that the self cannot be perceived by any other power than its own power of perception? It will be useful to use a microscope with your ears. Will a microscope reveal to you what is contained in a painting? Then how? Through an instrument constructed of argument, can you expect to have knowledge of that which is beyond the power of speech and mind? According to this conception, I have concluded after reading the Shastras that there is no possibility of ascertaining the true nature of the self by arguments. All of the Vedas agree on this point. Nayam atma pravachanena labhyo na medhaya na bahuna shrutena from Mundaka Upanishad, which means the Supreme Lord is not obtained by expert explanations, by vast intelligence, nor even by much hearing. And tarka pratishtanat from Bhama Sutra, logical reasoning is inconclusive. There are many statements like these, and so we don't have to listen to what Harry or Joe has to say. Rather, we should pay heed to the statements of the all-knowing Mahatmas and the teaching of the Vedas. Well, yeah. <laughs> Pramachari, we have so little time. Uh, we only have one more stop before we get off. Could you please finish what you have to say? Because this round of arguments among learned men will never cease. Good. Now listen to what I am saying. First, we must define the real I. Is it the body, the mind, or something else? In this connection, the verse from the Bhagavad Gita will help us to understand. Indriyani paranyahura, indrebya paradmana, manasastu paravudhir, yogude pararasatusaha. It is said that the senses are superior to the body. Superior to the senses is the mind. Superior to the mind is the intellect. And that which is superior to the intellect is known as the atma, the soul. The sense organs are preeminent in the body, but when analyzed, we find that they are nothing but slaves to the mind. For if you are unmindful, even when a drum is beaten next to your ear, you will not hear it, right? 
Still, everyone has a mind, even a madman, but his is not under his control. So everything about him will be off balance and inconsistent, even his senses. So it can be concluded that intelligence is superior to the senses in the mind. Nevertheless, without a support, without something to illuminate it, the intelligence cannot be activated. The illuminating factor is the top mind, the soul full of consciousness and self luminous truth revealed by its own light. Yes, yes. Although the body may be self contained, in the absence of the soul, it becomes immobile. Hmm? Today we lavish affection on our person due to their beauty, good qualities, and intelligence. And we can't bear to be apart from them, even for an instant. Yet, if he or she should die tomorrow, then what will we do? Their beautiful body, which was so dear to us, the object of our attachment, do we keep it in our homes? No. We take the body to the cremation ground and burn every last trace of its existence. That is what we do, even though our hearts break with grief. Why? Because we know that he or she that dwelled in that body, he or she who used to laugh and play with us, sometimes happy, sometimes sad, today that person is no more. He has left that body, the place of the senses. And now that body will simply rot. We can understand that the body is not the real person. The body is his house, his residence, and he has left it. That is the nature of the soul. He goes from body to body, birth after birth, until he realizes his true nature. That is what we have to say to you today. You are not your body. Your lives, your families, are all temporary. Here we all sit together on this train. And in a moment, we will all get off and go our separate ways. Will we think of ourselves as spirit soul? Will we remember? This life is but a moment in the history of our soul. Gentlemen, you have all listened so intently to us. Now awake and arise from this false conception of self and understand your true nature as a servant of the servant of Sri Krishna, reality the beautiful. Katwa! Katwa! All right, this is our stop. Namaskar, my friends. Until we meet again, so you please all remember these instructions. For they will give you everything. They will give you your eternal benefit. This is the Sanatan Dharma. So always chant the, it boils down to three things. Always remember the Lord and two things. Always remember the Lord and never forget him. And how to do that? By three methods. By being lower than the strong and free. Being more humble than a tree. You know, giving all respect and honor to others. In such a state of mind, you could always change the holy name of the Lord constantly. And then you'll have achieved perfection. Don't be attached. Don't forget what they have told us. Or take to heart this deep secret we heard today and go further. I have heard what they told me about my real self. And I cannot live my life the same way as before. And you, audience, what do you think?